today on Issue at Hand. It's 10 o'clock. Do you know who makes your comics? I mean, I guess I don't know if it's 10 o'clock. You could be watching this anytime, really. This is Issue at Hand, Polygon's show about the strange world of comics, and I'm your host, Susanna Polo. Who makes comics and what do they do to make them seem like simple questions, but the answer can be surprisingly complicated. A lot of nerds come into comics to follow characters, and it can be frustrating when a writer or artist you just can't bring yourself to like takes over. But it's a sign of a mature comics fan when you can take a step back, follow the artists you like, and come back to your favorite characters later. And that starts with knowing who makes your comics and how they do it. Chances are you have read a lot of comics where the story and art were made by the same person. This is generally how newspaper comic strips are made and a lot of independent graphic novels. But that's not true for all comics, especially comics that come out monthly, like most of the ones you'll see in a comic store. America's comics industry was born out of its pulp novel industry, valuing speed and quantity, which led to an assembly line structure of comic making. Each issue needed someone to fill about half a dozen tasks. It needed a writer to come up with the story and characters, a penciler to draw it, an inker to go over the pencil lines and fill in the black spaces, a colorist to color it, and a letterer to draw in the dialogue balloons and the dialogue and all of the sound effects. Back in the day, it was common for all of these roles to be done separately. Now, a few of them are often combined. A penciler might ink their own work, or the lettering might be done with a computer. And sometimes the lines between roles will be blurred. The collaboration between writer and penciler can be anywhere on a spectrum, from scripts that are just a broad outline of the plot, to ones with very specific panel descriptions. A lot of classic superhero comics were written using what came to be known as the Marvel Method, after Stan Lee used it extensively to build the Marvel Universe with his artist collaborators. Instead of handing over a complete script, Stan would give an artist a basic outline of the story and leave the actual plotting of the issue to them. Then, when the art was done, he would come back in and provide specific dialogue for each panel. The Marvel method was widely used because it freed writers up to work on lots of books at a time, and it gave artists more power over the stories. But it did sometimes result in disagreement. After a lot of similar mix-ups, John Byrne famously quit X-Men after he drew Colossus easily ripping a stump out of the ground, and then Chris Claremont wrote in dialogue about how hard it was. Today, a lot of artists ink their own pencils. Digital painting has smoothed the process enough that professional inkers are no longer as common as they used to be. But inks still considerably change the visual impact of a penciled image, clarifying lines and rendering shadows. And a colorist can completely change the mood of a comic, even when other artists remain consistent. This is from my favorite Batman story, The Long Halloween, written by Jeff Loeb, drawn by Tim Sale, and colored by Gregory Wright. And this is from Catwoman When in Rome, written by Jeff Loeb, drawn by Tim Sale, and colored by Dave Stewart. And there's a secret extra role that's now hidden inside the colorist's job. Chances are that the colorist on your favorite superhero comic worked with a flatter. Flatters prep inked digital art for coloring by filling in the line work with basic starting colors, which makes it easy for the colorist to use digital tools to pick out those shapes and efficiently edit them into the gradients and effects of the final comic. Comics also need to have dialogue and text, which is where the letterer comes in. Lettering has changed a lot in the digital era, with the use of digital fonts instead of hand-inked text, but a letterer's work can still have a huge impact. My favorite letterer is also a pretty famous one, as letterers go. Chances are you have read the handwritten text of Todd Klein, even if you don't know his name. His work is all over DC Comics from the late 80s on, and he lettered almost all of the Sandman, inventing distinct visual styles for many of the main characters. He was an early adopter of computer lettering based on his own handwritten fonts and has won 17 Eisner Awards for his work. I first encountered him in my very first superhero comic, Batman Year One. This is a case where my favorite story growing up was written in a single person's handwriting. Even now, if I'm reading a Batman story I've never seen before, but it feels familiar somehow, I'll check the credits. And more often than not, Todd Klein lettered it. It's an uncanny effect, like recognizing a voice actor, but in a medium where no one's actually speaking. And finally, every comic needs an editor. Because when you're coordinating up to six artists, somebody has to herd the cats and make sure that nobody sneaks the word sex into every page of New X-Men number 118. But editors don't just coordinate and proofread, they also craft the overall direction of the publisher. Do you like fables? 
John Constantine, Sandman, Preacher, Why the Last Man, or Transmetropolitan? These are all series edited by Karen Berger, the founding editor of DC's Vertigo imprint. Her eye for fantastical stories that appealed to adults has resulted in some of DC Comics' biggest hits. And that's why it's important to know how many people make your comics. Writers and artists are the rock stars of the industry, but there are plenty more folks standing behind them. If you support the artists you like, you'll be supporting the stories you like. And hopefully, you'll encourage the industry to be one that supports people, not just characters. I was reading about Flo Steinberg, and she was talking about how when, when Marvel like started getting popular, it was still just like, they're all working with freelancers. So like before there was a bullpen or anything, it was just her and Stan Lee in an office and kids would find their address from the comics and like come by and want to like meet everyone. And she was like, and I'd have to trip them. Like they would push past me through the door. Aww. Like, <laughs> she's like, and it was cute, but like people were working. <laughs>